about Java statements. And again, I'm going to keep this fairly brief. Um, so, uh, right. Um, we're going to be seeing within the models we explore today um, a number of, of methods which are built up. These are, these are functions um, that are associated with a class. They may be associated with main. They may be associated with an agent class. They may be associated with a separate class, as we'll see. Um, and a given method will typically either perform an action, return a value, or both. Okay. It, it, uh, it's good if you could separate the two, um, because often that lends clarity of understanding of, of what's, what it's accomplishing. But you'll sometimes see both combined together. Um, so uh, methods, uh, naming of methods is important so that when you see them used, you have some understanding of what they do. And it's one of uh, the keys to sort of clean, uh, clean coding. Um, methods are composed of a couple, couple um, uh, pieces. Most notably, there's a header that specifies what information needs to be provided to the method in the form of so-called parameters for it to do its work. So what information needs to be provided to it, and what information, if any, does it return? Void being an indication it returns nothing, um, but it may return an integer, it may return a, a double value. And then there's a thing called exceptions, which you'll see in this code also, which describe um, how, it re how it can react legally to unexpected circumstances. And generally it's by doing what's called throwing an exception. It says, I don't know what to do right now because of this type of thing. And that type of thing could be, I couldn't find a file. Or there is a problem with reading a file, in a so-called I.O. exception. Or um, there was a problem with some of the data that was specified in this network file that I couldn't understand. I was expecting an integer and I got I got, you know, uh, someone's name or something like that. Um, so, uh, generally speaking, we want, we want methods to have a clearly well-defined purpose. And you can think, in terms of best practices, that it, uh, it's valuable to have a, a sort of contract of sorts. So if someone gives that method the information it needs, that's a clear indication of what it does. That doesn't require you to look at the how it does it at the body of the, um, of the function. So by looking just at the header, which is specified in any logic, and I'll show you um, where you could see a header. I'll just uh, show an example. Um, so if you um, uh, load in one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, things that, that I, I asked you to open there, We'll, we'll load it in. You can go see methods within that. Um, so I'm going to go to to the um, to the example models for this class um, uh, and and open up the particular models. So there was um, uh, right uh, file driven models. Here we go. And uh, it's this hard-coded one. Uh, and what you'll see within the hard-coded model here, um, uh, I opened the, the uh, hard-coded one, uh, the, fir the, um, the sort of s most, most basic of them. Um, and what you'll see is there's a set of functions here. And within any logic, it separates out the headers from the non-header. So for example, there's something that call, says establish network transitions in populations from connectivity matrix file. Um, and you'll see when you click on that function, it actually separates out header information here. And you can see it gives some, some information here. So one thing is the return type. What information does it give back, if anything? Void means it doesn't give back any information. Um, but it could return a Boolean, a true or false value, an integer, a double, et cetera. And then there's information about what it demands. What are its so-called arguments or parameters? What information does it need to do its job? And by looking at this information in its name and then uh, some description, you should have a sense of what a function does. It doesn't, ideally, it shouldn't require you to go look at the body of the function and how it does its work because it causes unnecessary complexity to people who use the function if they have to go look at its code to understand it. So a good naming is part of this, naming of the parameters, naming of the function, 
um, and, and generally having a sort of clear, well-defined purpose that's, that's indicated by the name will, will help as well. Okay, um, so the, the name and header fun uh, function collectively give um, much hints as to what its job in life is. And one of the things that was discovered in software engineering over the past 10 years is that really well-named functions can actually um, materially improve the, uh, the quality of the software development process. What we're going to be focusing on, though, in this particular smaller lecture is method bodies. Method bodies, the body of the method is, is um, where uh, we store additional information. So if we look at this code, we look at the code. This is the body of the so-called body of the method, body of the function. That's where it does its work. That's where the how is specified. Um, so if the name and description specifying what it does, the body specifies how it does it. And it consists of several pieces. One is comments, and these you'll see in green in any logic. So if we, if we go and look at that, and you look in any logic, there's these things with double slashes in green, and that's not the only type. There's a, a further type of comment which can last multiple lines is with a slash star and star slash, and I can comment out multiple lines with that. Um, I'm going to uh, eliminate that, but you'll see this is a single line comment. The r anything that's on, whoa, the remainder of that line after this double slash is considered part of the comment. They're ignored, um, almost entirely ignored by the five fields. There's, there's a few small exceptions. Um, so don't surprise that you elicit useful information. Um, a second thing that's there is variable declarations, th places where we'll declare a variable. Um, that's useful to us in the course of this method. And finally, statements. And we're going to be discussing, focusing mostly on statements today. Um, okay, so we, we talked about comments. And comments are really important to describe your intentions, what code is doing, so that when you look at it, you have some sense of what's going on here. So if you look at any logic models, um, this is the wandering elephants model, you'll see comments thrown in there that, that comment on what the developer was uh, was trying to accomplish with certain lines of code. So, for example, it says avoid bounds in water, change direction if needed, um, try a new, so if you get here, try a new <coughs> heading until you find a valid one, and then start moving in that direction. Those are indications of what the code is doing, and the details of the code, again, deal with, with the how. Um, we're going to be focusing on statements here, okay? We talked um, a few times ago, I think it was in this room last week, about Java expressions. Java expressions calculate values. They calculate a value which can be stored in a variable, for example. That value could be a double, it could be an int, it could be a, a, a character, it could be a boolean, and one or a couple other types of so-called primitive values, but then it could also be a reference, a reference to some object. And that object could be to a person or to the main class or, or to an experiment for that matter. Um, so Java expressions compute values. That's what their job is. They evaluate for value. And so they're kind of like the formulas we see in a spreadsheet or the formulas we did in, in algebra when we, were, um, uh, when we were much younger. Statements, by contrast, do something. They affect some change. They change something. So they're commands. For example, they may change the value of the variable or field using, a, using an assignment expression. That's one type of expression that, in addition to computing value, also changes things. A statement may just do that. It may return a value. It may call a method. In other words, say, hey, do this thing for me. It may perform a sequence of statements a certain number of times or until some condition is met. And, um, and then, uh, based on some condition, it may do one thing or another thing, um, so-called conditional, with an if statement, for example. Um, so generally, when any logic seeks action code, for example, on a handler, and we give it a statement, we give it a statement or a set of statements. Okay, so these are a set of statements you'll see a lot. And I want to feature these in part because you'll see them today when we go through the code for, for reading in these. Uh, if statements, for statements, while, or do while, um, try, catch, finally, um, throw as a, as a statement, or throw an exception. Um, and then you can have a statement that's simply an expression. 
Now, that expression, for it to be a statement, it really isn't meaningful to just compute to value because it's doing nothing. And the job of a statement is to do something. So you can have it if it just computes value, but it, it accomplishes nothing except a waste of time, the computer's time. So generally, the expressions that are statements are assignments, or they're calls to functions. They call off to a method or a function to, to, to accomplish something. Um, and then finally, we can have a composite statement, a statement that's composed of substatements, um, possibly with some variable declarations in it. So we'll see several types of for statements. These are the two most common, um, most common ones. Uh, the details will vary, but, but these are give a, a sense of them. So the first of them just iterates over for a certain number of times, in this case 100 times, a variable goes from some early value to, to some maximum value, and it's increased by one every time. And each of those times, it gets a new value of the variable to the statement of Now you'll notice that a variable is actually declared here, i. That's declared right here. This is something you couldn't do in C, for example, from which Java was de uh, derived as a language. But this is declaring a variable called i, and that variable i can only be seen within this statement. Okay? Um, so it iterates over all integers. So it goes through and it has i equals 0, and it executes the statement with i equals 0. And then it has i equal 1, and it executes the statement for that. i equals 2 executes the statement with that, all the way up to i equals 99, executes the statement with that, increases i again. This is so this is what it does initially. Um, it does it, it executes the statement as long as this value is true, if this expression is true, i is less than 100. And then after each execution of the statement, it does this thing here, which is incrementing the, the value i. It's changing the value of i. We saw that last time by increasing it by 1. We saw it sort of two times ago when I talked about expressions. So it's running the statement again and again and again. And finally, when i gets to 100, just after it's increased it, it checks, OK, is i less than 100? Is 100 less than 100? No. And it bombs out. It doesn't execute the statement that way. So this statement will be executed 100 times. Imagine if this were 2, it will be executed when i is 0 and i is 1. Two times. But i will never actually be 100 here. It might actually be 99, 0, 1, 2, 3, so on to 99. Okay. This one here, this latter statement, depends on a collection. If you have a collection of some sort, this collection could be a list, it could be an array, it could be a hash table, it could be what have you. If you have some collection, Java has tons of collections, ways of storing um, a set of data of sorts. Um, a, and it may be structured collections or le more or less structured collections. You can basically have you could draw values from this collection over and over and over again for each of the values in the collection. And this is the name of the value you want to draw, A. So it's saying essentially, OK, imagine let A be each successive member of this connection, of this collection in turn, and for each of those, execute the statement with A being bound to that. OK? Um, so these are variable declarations you see, see here. It's saying, OK, there's a variable called A. It's an agent. It's a reference to an agent. And it's being drawn from each of these elements of the collection. If there's no element of the collection, it'll just fall through. It will never execute statement. If there's one el element of the collection, it'll just go through with A being bound to that. If there are two, A will be bound each successively. And it's going through with the statement. OK? So, so that's a way of sort of iterating through each of the elements. You'll see that a tremendous amount. OK, um, so for example, here in some Java code, we have um, uh, a nested for. So this one increments the variable a. Each time, it's incrementing it by pi over 16. And here, we have d. And each time, it's incrementing it by 5. This is not my code. I wouldn't want it to be my code. Uh, I disavow any association with this code. Um, but what you see is a nested, a nested uh, set of, of uh, four loops where, again, a variable is introduced. There's a condition under which the loop will be executed. And if it is executed, then we make this change at the end. And we come back and consider, OK, is it time to execute it again? Is it time to execute it again? OK? OK. 
Um, here's the if statement. This, again, is one of the most critical of them. An if statement occurs in two variants. You can either have if with no else or if with an else. So this statement basically tests a condition. This is an expression. It computes a value, a Boolean. True or false. If it is true, we do conditional, otherwise we do the consequent, otherwise we do the alternative, if the alternative is specified. If no alternative is specified, if this is true, the, the statement is, is executed, this is the, the consequent, if not, it just falls through. Okay? Um, it's like having an empty false statement. That's all. Okay, so if. Okay, so once again, there's if uh, statements you'll see all around. So if the amount of vegetation is is greater than a certain minimum threshold, then that vegetation gets trampled by the elephants. Okay, um, periodically. Okay, uh, rerouting around barriers. If we're in some sort of situation where we're hitting a barrier, we need to do something different. Um, okay, um, right. Uh, so, well, we've seen we've seen some. Um, functions uh, here within this within this uh, elephant model for example it's a function called heading random and then there's a body to it which actually accomplishes setting the agent speed and direction um, uh, in in a um, in a random direction um, and uh, setting the speed to some some particular value um, okay uh, another type of statement we'll see quite a bit is a while statement the statement will it's kind of like a for in the sense that it only does a certain, executes a certain substatement, a certain, while well, a certain condition is true. But here we don't have, with for, we have a specification on how to change the, the situation each time, such as incrementing a value. Here we don't. All we're doing is saying, as long as this value is true, perform this. Okay? And there's two variants uh, of this, the while and do while loop. So a while loop, ooh, excuse me, this is a do while loop. So this does this first, does this, and then when it reaches the bottom, it checks if this is true. If so, it'll do it again. If so, it'll do it again. If so, it'll do it again. If it's false, it will just fall through. So that's one variant of the loop. You have the do clause up front with telling it what to do first, and then while will only sort of re reiterate it if, if this is true. Um, and uh, an alternative is where you have uh, the, the, while, um, uh, the while up top, and then you have something beneath it that is done until, until it's true. Okay, um, a further thing that I mentioned is a composite block. So this, for example, You'll notice this curly bracket here and the curly bracket uh, down here. That is a statement. It's called a composite statement. It's composed of statements within it and variable declarations. Um, this is a composite statement under the if. It allows you to have many, many substatements here. Here, the only thing is a single statement, so you don't really need it. A composite statement can have in it variable declarations, and it can have in it many, many statements. Um, so in general, you, we can use a composite statement to, to have a set of code underneath, say, an if, or underneath a, a, for, a for loop. Yes? So it's very useful to start with pseudocode. Um, and in fact, start with pseudocode from a high level where you have a sort of uh, more uh, coarse-grained understanding of what needs to happen. And then you work down from there. And often what you do is you put in place the structures in the form of methods which um, uh, you don't specify initially what their bodies are. You don't specify how they do things. All you know is sort of what they should do. And and you sort of work in terms of them. So you translate from your pseudocode to calls, say, to methods of various sorts, where the methods are pretty coarse-grained. And then each of those methods, once you have a sense of how it should work, you sort of break that down in more detail inside of it, in its body. So you kind of work from the top down um, with some broad understanding of how to decompose the problem. 
It's divide and conquer. You know, you divide it up into pieces, and you think what those pieces should be. Okay, first it's logically got to do this, and then it's logically got to do that. You, you articulate what those kind of sub pieces are. You give them uh, a name as a as a method, and then you can have calls to those methods successfully, and then you can go and define what's within those methods. So at first, as it's sometimes said, you pretend someone really smart other than yourself is going to write those methods. And you just treat it, okay, they're, they're, you don't have to worry about them. Just think at the high level what you have to do, what information are they going to need to do their job. You provide that information, and then eventually, if it's you who's got to define those methods, you'll get around to it, but as far as the high-level code is considering, it's just calling off to these methods. It doesn't have to worry, the high-level code doesn't have to worry about all the gory details of the, what's in those methods. So you That's hidden. So in our basic approach, then would you recommend yeah. that as opposed to starting at the agent? So pseudocode yeah. and down yeah. versus starting at the agent trying to build time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not really a, a clear mapping as opposed to sort of levels of the model. But essentially, whether you work at the agent level or the high, highest levels of the model, like uh, the main class level. Typically there's a problem and there's, there's, you've got to think about a systematic way to address that problem. Maybe it's totaling up the number of agents that are between ages X and Y. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's trying to output data to a database. Maybe it's um, uh, trying to derive the um, uh, the variability in some quantity within the model. I don't know what the problem is, but typically you articulate the problem, you think about what are the logical sub-pieces of the problem, you think about um, how, how you can use the sort of tools Java provides in the terms of, of values and statements, sort of expressions and statements, to, to sort of start to work uh, to accomplish those tasks. Like maybe there's a loop, you loop until something is true. Or maybe there's a condition, you're gonna handle this case differently than that case. So that might be where you have a, an if statement. Um, but it's very important that you start with a high level understanding, you articulate those high level sort of pieces, and you take that and you keep that description, and eventually that becomes code in and of itself. Um, it's just that it's code that typically includes calls to, to methods or to functions that are themselves later defined. And we're going to see a lot of this in just a few minutes with these models, okay? And in fact, what I've done is I've created three models to address this issue in, in what I consider more and more rigorous and flexible ways of reading um, networks from files. And I do it in ways that I consider sort of cleaner and, uh, and, cl and in some cases clearer. Okay, um, right. Um, so uh, I've mentioned uh, variables last time with the, uh, in terms of expressions. Variables in Java are associated with types and can contain values. We talked about that. When we declare a variable, we introduce its name and type, or we indicate its name and type. So here's a variable and it has a type double, a variable's name is y, and it has a value initially assigned to it that's a call to, to get y. Um, uh, this is, these are examples of expression statements. So these are statements. We separate statements, to, we end statements in Java with a semicolon. That indicates it's the end of a statement. It can therefore distinguish one statement from another, the start of one statement from the end of another one. And these are expressions as well. This is an assignment expression. It computes a value, but it also, importantly, does something. It assigns a value to heading. It changes something. And therefore, it can be a statement in and of itself. If, by contrast, we had simply something like x plus 10, that wouldn't really make sense as a statement by itself, because it computes that value, but does nothing with it. An assignment statement changes something. It assigns to a variable. And so it can be a statement by itself. It, it kind of makes sense. Similarly, if we have a method call, this is a method call by itself. It's a statement by itself. It ends with a semicolon. And we call that method, and it does something. This, here we're not doing anything with value, so presumably this accomplishes something. And in fact, the name suggests that. It moved to, that probably starts the elephant moving somewhere. Or, or actually moves it 
somewhere. Um, so this is a method call. It's an expression. It, it's, it's a type of expression, but it actually changes something. So it's an expression statement. So this is a whirlwind look at some of the types of Java statements um, that we see and how they're interwoven with variables. Typically, variables are mixed in with our statements. Back in the days of, of, of uh, pure C programming, variable declarations had to be um, separated out um, in the early stages of C up to the top of a, of a, of a function. Here they can be kind of intermixed with variables within statements, and we use those variables often within the statements uh, locally. So here, these variables are defined here, and um, and then uh, they're not known about elsewhere. Okay, um, I have some more lecture material on statements and so on, but I want to get to these models because I want to I want to use them as teaching vehicles for some of these concepts and because um, I think they can be useful um, uh, in and of their own, own self. So what I'd like you to do, I've asked, I've asked everyone uh, to go download these. If anyone um, did not do it, they're in Stellar site under the example models area called, it's a third one down called example success of file-based network creation models. They are in a zip file. That zip file contains three subfolders, each of which provides a model. And the models are in successive levels of sophistication and flexibility. Okay? So um, I'd like to walk through the first two models today. The third model is quite advanced. It uses uh, a set of Java features that we probably won't be touching on for several weeks. These include things like uh, reflection, uh, subclassing, and subtyping, and um, they, they lend uh, great flexibility to the model, um, but they are uh, outside the scope of what I want to cover today. Um, so uh, I'd like to open up the first of these models right now. And this is called hard-coded minimalist network ABM model with file-driven network structure. Whoa. OK. Um, so that's a mouthful. Um, so uh, we can go uh, double click on this and you'll see something, uh, if you open main, you'll see something like the above. Um, this is, by the way, the same model we've built up together before. I just used it as a, as a vehicle um, to, to, to this network-based model to read a network, um, network information. So, um, you know, I should have uh, pointed you to one other thing just so you're aware of it. In one of these models, um, and I'm going to have to uh, check which it is, because um, you probably want to point it to it. Um, if you go to hard-coded, um, here we go. Yeah, the hard-coded um, minimalist network ABM model. Uh, you'll notice there's two files within that. Um, and uh, the files are in two different formats. There's one that's called uh, PyX sample sample network file, um, uh, which is in a PIEC format. And there's another model, uh, which is in a uh, format which includes some, um, some connections matrices. But what I actually wanted to do was show you, yes, this is the one. So if you go to the advanced one, and I apologize for not putting these um, in, in an appropriate place. If you go there into the advanced one, what you'll see is that there's, there's actually two files illustrating connectivity matrices by themselves. Um, this is a three-person connectivity matrix. This is a, I believe, four-person connect, no, uh, four connectivity matrix. Um, and there's additionally the PIEC, uh, the PIEC model, okay? Uh, PIEC is a uh, software which I had mentioned before and which is actually linked to on this uh, site, uh, this, this PIEC, uh, this, this one here, it's for social network analysis. It's, I think, the most popular platform for social network analysis. There's, uh, UCI Net is also very popular and increasingly uh, Gephi, I think. Um, okay, so, um, these files uh, are going to be used within uh, within these um, uh, within these models, and uh, what I've done here um, is is to actually hard code sort of where to look for the files, and 
It's under main in the startup code. So if you go to main in general, um, there's, a, there's actually a call to something that says establish network uh, transitions and populations from PIEC network file. And there's one that's commented out just above there that's established network transitions and populations from connectivity network file, okay? So briefly speaking, what I did is I created these three different models that each can read different types of model formats, uh, or, uh, sorry, network file formats. And the two formats on which I concentrated were a PIEC format and a format based on binary connection matrices, okay? Um, and I created three different models because um, uh, I wanted to illustrate both software, uh, sort of how you build up a model, some of the considerations that come in in refactoring the model to be cleaner, and also to allow for greater generality. So the latter, the more advanced one allows time dynamic networks, in other words, networks where um, it will change over time. At time zero, it'll be one structure. At time three, it'll be another structure. At time six, it'll be another, etc. So what I'm going to do here is to, um, to run each of these uh, in front so you can get a, a, an understanding of what they do. And then we'll go into how they do it. Bear in mind that um, in each one, under main in the startup code, there will be some pointer to a file on your, uh, on your um, to where it can find a file. The location of this will differ probably for different computers. So you will have to kind of re point it for your computer where it will be. You probably don't have a, um, you know, a, a classes folder with, with the same structure as I do. So um, we should, um, you, you, you will have to, you'll have to change that. But let me go run it on mine. So this is the simplest one. And what this is going to do is it's going to read in a file from um, a certain, okay, so yeah, this actually complained. It couldn't find this file, you'll notice. Um, it says unable to impose specified networks due to file not found in this thing. So I've got to go point it to the right thing. You'll probably encounter a very similar thing. I've rearranged these. So I need to point it to the appropriate place. It's no longer in example models alone. It's in example models subfolder. Um, can you take primitive Can I what? Can you take primitive uh, w Well, um, it's a good question. The question is what they would be relate, uh, relative to. Um, I believe the question is, I don't know if any logic will define it relative to its own path or whether to the, it's, it may be to the model location. I think it's the model location, but you'd have to check on that. Okay, so folks, um, I'm going to go point it on my computer to the right place here. So on mine, it's under this file driven, so it's under example models, but it's under file driven network structure. And same thing with the PIEC one. Um, Okay, there we go. Um, so let's run this now. Uh, so if we run it, what we'll see is, okay, so it's still having some issue with it. Um, file not found, okay, it still couldn't find file driven network structure and it's looking in minimalist uh, connectivity matrix, okay. Minimalist network ABM um, with file driven network structure, right. Um, so uh, I am going to instead point, I'm going to bring all these things out to the top folder here and, and do it right there. Okay. So, so I'm going to take this out. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so I've just rearranged where these files are in my system. So it'll, there we go. Okay. So, um, what we've seen here is um, a situation where um, it's reading in a certain file. Um, in this case, the file is, um, is given by this. So it's a connectivity matrix file, and it's the file that was called connectivity matrix network file. What may be simplest for you is to take those files, which are under the advanced folder, and put them in some known place on your computer where you know what its path is, and then just 
put a path, bearing in mind that if you're on a Windows system back, the backslash needs to be two backslashes because Java understands it uh, as an escape character. Yeah. So, uh, this works for me. I have a file and I'm going Yes, yes. I'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, that was one of sort of the design decisions when I did this. We can. Um, uh, you can figure out how better to handle arcs, but yeah, I'll, t I'll talk about that and we'll see where that happens, okay? Where that decision is, is sort of operationalized. Okay, so um, this is reading in a connectivity file, um, which is defined here, and this is a binary file. Um, for this version of the model, the simplest version of the model, it is taking in a file uh, and uh, it can either be a PyEC file or a um, connectivity matrix file specified like this, it is imposed at, at the very first point in time, and that's it. Okay, so it just reads it in, imposes it on the network, and then the models run. Okay, uh, so that's uh, this version of the the software, and that's the hard coded minimalist, and we'll see how this is done in just a second. And um, the next level up uh, from that is a um, is one that uh, I call intermediate one, and the intermediate one is has a very similar functionality, but it does it more cleanly. So instead of having all these functions littering the main class, what we actually see here is a clear situation. We don't have as much clutter, and it's actually accomplished in a more somewhat more general way. Um, however, it runs in basically the same fashion. The final one, which we have, um, is, is called advanced. And this requires quite a lot more mechanism. Um, and the advanced one in particular um, is going to run. I'm going to have to point it to where the, new, the files are newly located. But um, essentially, what it's going to be doing is to um, is to allow uh, time varying, time varying models. Um, so uh, let's let's try running this here, and uh, if we run this, we should see a uh, a situation where oh, oh, it's still okay. It couldn't find it. Yep, it couldn't find it. So let's go see where it is. Okay, so it's looking at file driven network structure advanced. Okay, that's I moved it out of advanced. That's why. Um, so I'm going to go back and put it there, advanced. Um, we might see it next time. It may have to be two weeks from now when we're, we'll see um, how to build a user interface where we can specify this graphically. Um, so in other words, we can select the file to bring in rather than specifying it with a path like that. Um, okay, so here's a case where it's reading it in and it's changing it dynamically over time. So. Um, Changing it from one network structure to another as it reads as it uses this data from a file, and this is using dynamic events and a bunch of other um, other, infra uh, other infrastructure. Okay, so I'd like to start with the first of these so we can understand what it's doing, and I think this will um, push your understanding a bit, but hopefully it will help you understand some motivations for some of the material which you've just seen and which will be presented. Okay. So what's going on here? So we need to read in from a file like this one or from a PyEC file that looks like this. Um, we need to read in data on what, what connections are on the population, but also what size the population is. Because a PyEC file, for example, gives a statement for the number of vertices to use. A connectivity file like this implicitly states what the population size is because this one and zeros, this indicates is, is, person, is one person connected to another. Um, to figure out how to read this, imagine that we number people um, one, two, three, and four. So if, if we consider this person one up here, two, three, four, um, and going across one, two, three, four, a one will indicate those two people are connected. So person one here is connected to person four, okay? Person two is connected to persons 
three and four. Person three is connected to person two. Person four is connected to person one and two. Now, you'll notice that this is symmetric. In other words, if person one is connected to two, two is connected to one. And that is what's assumed as the default in any logic. There are ways to force one-way connections, um, but uh, the built-in infrastructure in any logic is using bidirectional connections. So when you say A connect, if person A connect to B, um, not only does that connect A to B, but B is connected to A. Okay? Um, and this gets to s some of the, the reason for the, um, uh, for, for the arc issue. So uh, here we have a connectivity matrix that's specifying the connectivity at time zero and from then on. Uh, by contrast, and, and yet it, it's assuming here a four person population, the PIAC file, by contrast, specifies the vertices and in fact gives them names, which we could ac actually impose in the any logic could say, you know, set their name to each of these values in turn. It specifies some number of arcs and some number of edges. Arcs here are unidirectional. They're from one to four, from one to two. Edges here are bidirectional. Between one and three, three and four, two and three. Okay. So we want to be able to read these files, use the information both about who's connected to who and about population size and impose that information on the population. And for this version of the, the model, we are simply doing that for time zero. Okay? So we've got to parse this thing. And I want to show you basically how this is done. This is an interesting example of, okay, we have a task. How do you decompose the task into pieces? As we'll see, it gets more textured as you start to need to do this over time. Um, I certainly didn't build in one. Um, uh, I, I, I must say that um, uh, I need to test this more rigorously and so on. Uh, in fact, one of my, my hopes is in the next few weeks to create a testing harness where I can do really serious stress testing on this. But um, this should handle uh, a very, very large number, as in thousands or So we'd have to look at that. I'm wondering, it has a certain set of assumptions based on PIEC file format. So I found an informal statement of PIEC format online, and I used that to figure out you know, uh, how, to dis how to sort of pick up what the values were here. And I'm wondering, could you send me that file? Um, because I can go in, maybe it has a comma where I'm expecting a space or something like that. Um, I couldn't find a full statement of the PIAC file format. All I found was something like 10 lines on it. And so I suspect that, um, I suspect that uh, there may be some things which weren't mentioned in those 10 lines. Um, I'm interested in making this into an industrial strength you know, thing for any logic so that this can be used by lots and lots of people. So if you can find any cases where it fails, I'd be really, really interested. Right now, this is. I can't tell you how off the press this is. This is, you know, I think it was done half an hour before I class or something like that. The three different versions. So, so this is this is early stuff. Um, uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to see if we can make this industrial strength, and you can help me um, figure out issues with it. Okay. So in short, um, we have to we have to uh, read these things in. So let's see how this is done. Um, so let's go down to main. What we'll see here is that I have a call in main to something called establish network transitions and populations from connectivity matrix file, okay? And that's, that's a call. It's a call to a method, and it gives it some information. It gives it a, a path here, path and file name. So let's go over and see that. Here's this, uh, excuse me, here's this function it's calling. You'll notice it's defined in main like all the other functions that are used by, uh, by it. And we'll go up to the header, 
and we see it takes in something called path and file name, true path and file name, which is a string. So that's what it needs to do its work. Without a, without a path and file name, it can't do much. And, and then it's going to do some work. Now, um, this work is not done in it alone. As we'll see, if we go and we look at the code in the body, um, it makes use of lots of things. Some of those things are built into Java's libraries. In other cases, they are they're functions I've defined. So you'll see a couple of things here. If you look at the body, before we try to understand this, you'll notice there's calls to lots of things. For example, there's something that says create population of size. And that's a method right here within main, create population of size. Another thing that it, it calls off to is count adjacency values specified. So that's actually calling off to another function here. So in short, this function is making use of these functions down here, as well as some other features. OK, so that's one feature to notice about, um, about, this, um, uh, about this method. Another feature to notice about the method is that there's this try around it. And what try is, that was one of the statements I, didn't, I, I, comment, I mentioned, but I didn't really comment on. This basically says, try out this code, and if anything exceptional happens, and you can specify the types of so-called exceptions you can handle, then do this thing. And in fact, that's what was yielding some of the messages we saw. So this is where it sort of, it gets an exception. This tells it what went wrong, basically. And I say, okay, I was unable to impose the specified networks due to some error, okay? So when I run this thing, um, if I were to go, let's go back to main and, and introduce a deliberate mistake, okay? So in main, I'm gonna misspell the name of the file. Um, uh, so I just put, uh, put some extra characters there. If I were to run this and, and try, to, try to run it here, it doesn't create, create anything. And it says unable to impose specified network due to error. And then it gives this error. That is essentially caused by, um, by this, this thing right here, okay? So this is printing to something called the system error stream, which is a place where you could send errors. We saw this in a previous lecture, and it prints some information to it. And here it's printing out this message and then the message from the error, okay? And that's printed to this console in red, okay? Okay, so, um, here in main, um, that's what uh, establish, um, uh, that's sort of this outer try catch. So basically what I'm doing is here, I'm cleaning up after myself. If anything goes wrong in here, I want to print out a message and so the user can know something about where it went wrong. They can read the message and know something about it. And in fact, if I refuse to do that, let's try if I refuse to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment this out and I'm going to comment out this thing, okay? Um, this is actually perfectly legitimate code now, but I'm going to actually try recompiling. I'm going to try rerunning this. Um, and it says, oh, can't run. Um, okay, yeah, 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 fine. Um, it's still using it, sorry. Um, it's still using this thing down here, this E, which is there. Okay, so now let's try running this. Okay, it's, sometimes it has trouble doing a build from there. I want it to do a build from up here. Um, okay. It tells me unhandled exception, unhandled exception. That's a sign that I have to have one of these try blocks. I need to, it, basically you need to, you need to clean up after yourself. Um, um, we're not kids anymore. Look, uh, if something goes wrong, we need to face up to it, own up to it, and do something about it. Hence this try block, okay? Often, for the types of models you folks are building, having something of exactly the sort is what you need. You need something that has a try and then a catch with this exception and then it prints something out and that allows the user to go figure out what went wrong. What else could go wrong here? Um, so we saw file not found. What, el what other things could go wrong can you think of that, that might happen? Finds the file with the wrong format. It's the wrong format in it. So maybe it finds something. So, you know, uh, if it tried reading through that PIAC file and it encountered a problem, it might have said something about what went wrong, like couldn't convert to an integer. 
you know, maybe it found what it thought was the number of a node and it's really the name of the node and it couldn't do anything with it. So um, that's something which could go wrong. Um, there could be a disk error, you know. Um, it could be the network's disconnected where you used to point it to. Any number of different things. Lots of things can go wrong. Having these sort of try catch things is enforced in many cases. It says you have to handle these conditions. And that's what this unhandled exception thing is, okay? Okay, so I have this try. Now, within here though, let's take a look at what the, the, the sort of steps are to address this problem. First, I got a way to read the file. And the way I did that is, is a, is a two-step process. I got what's called a file reader, and then I got a buffered reader. Why did I do that? Because a buffered reader allows me to read one line at a time. So I can do this read line thing, okay? Um, and then what I do is I go down, and basically I retrieve each line from this, and I, and for the first line, excuse me, so I read the first line here. Um, for the first line, I count the number of values on it. I count the number, the width of, of this, um, the number of, of zeros and ones here. Why do I need to do that? Because I need to decide the population size. So I get a count of nodes, and this is returned by this method called count adjacent values. So I came up with that name without writing that function. I didn't write that function first. I just called that, I, I knew, okay, I need to count the number of, of adjacent values. So I basically created this line before I defined this function. And later I came back and I defined the function. Later I came back and I defined that method, okay? But I knew what it needed. It, in order to, to find the number of values on this line, it needs to get some sort of information about this line. And that's what this str line is. This basically read in from the thing that reads the file, it read in a line, and so I've got to give it this line to figure out, so it can figure out how many zeros and ones are on it. I knew that. So I, I basically created this call, and later I came back and defined what that method would, how it would work, okay? And that, that call basically returns a count of nodes. That's what I wanted back. I wanted how many things are there here? Is it zero, one, two, three, four, five? And based on that, I want to create a population of that size. Okay, um, just so we don't, well, okay, so I'll, I'll come back to those in, in a minute here. Okay, so first I needed to figure out how many things are in the population. Then I need to create a population of that size. Why did I need to do that first? Why do I need to create a population of size before I start connecting people? Why didn't I start connecting people first? Yeah, you don't know how many there are. How can I connect people that don't exist yet, right? So I need to first create the population. That's why that was kind of forced here. I needed to first create the population. In order to do that, I need to know how many people to create. So this is what I'm talking about, sort of working backwards. Okay, so what do I need to do here? Okay, I want to connect the nodes, but I can't connect the nodes until I know how many people are, I need to have the population. To have the population, I need to know how big it is. So in order to do that, I need to read some line of this file and I need to count the number of zeros and ones on it. And that's exactly what this does. I create the population and then I go through each line, as it says, go through this and subsequent rows, adding in the connections. And so then I have a call to a method that says add connections from connectivity matrix row. And it passes the number of the row, what's the current row number, and then what's the, what are the elements of that line? What are the sort of things in this line? That's what I figured it needs to know to, to, um, to connect the things up. So if I know this is for the third person and, and that this is the people to whom it's connected, then that function should then be able to go sort of add in this connection. And that was my thought. Um, so I go through each successive line of this file, starting here, go through this one, this one, this one, first, second, third, fourth, and each success one, I'm passing this method called add connections from connectivity matrix row, the number of the person, like person three, and then, then sort of what they're, this, this thing here, and they figure out, it figures out um, which other ones to connect to. And I do that as long as I'm not, as long as uh, I still have lines left, and as long as I haven't run out of lines in the file. Mm -hmm. like, 
this had to be able to deal, let's suppose there was only three of those. What happens then? Well, I just do this until I'm out of lines. And that's what this str line equals that not equal to null. This thing, read line, will return a null if there's no file lines left. And so if there's no file lines left, they bomb out. OK. So these things here? You mean like uh, in here? In, in this condition? Yeah, because this is an and. This is saying um, only continue to do this, continue to go add rows in as long as we're not beyond the last row, mm -hmm. um, and as long as there's the next line is not empty. Um, that's, that's what this is. And so this and, yeah, I can put as many things as you want. I can have and or, you know, um, various conditions. And as long as they string them together with, uh, with logical operators. This is an expression. It computes a value. And all while cares is that it has a value, a true false value at the end of the day. So as long as this expression evaluates to a true or false, it can be as long as we want it to be. It can be, it can call off to a method. It can, it could have 10,000 conditions on it. It's just, that wouldn't be that clear in a while. So we probably want to break them up for other reasons. But yeah, it can, it can be arbitrarily um, rich. In this case, there were really two things. I don't, I don't want to go more than I know are needed, and I didn't want to go beyond the end of the file. Now, you could ask, do I really need both those conditions? Like, maybe the file should always end here, but I wasn't sure if it always would end there. I mean, um, maybe there's extra things at the end of it or whatever, and I, I just wanted to, to stop when either of those conditions were true. There's also the question of, let's suppose I had a truncated file like that. What to do? And I just said, I'm just going to handle the first part of it. And if it's like that, I'll assume the others are symmetric and, and not specified. OK, so what we've seen is sort of the high level problem right there. OK, I needed, I, I needed to add people's connections to each other. To do that, I needed a population. To have that population, I needed a population size. And to figure out the population size and what connections to add to each other, I needed a way of reading the file. And that's basically what's here. Um, this buffered reader is the way of reading the file. If you search online, read file lines or something like that, Java, you'll, you'll probably find something like that so you can read the line. And that's what allows me to go through each line by line. Now, when I wrote this, I was counting on my big brother. I was counting on my brother who's going to write this and this in this. Now, as it turns out, my brother's busy, so I had to write it myself. So, <laughs> actually, I don't think my brother would know how to write it, but that's OK. Um, uh, but conceptually, I was not thinking about what the details of this are, were. I was having, as we say, a separation of concerns. I don't want to think about what those, all the gory details those involve. All I want to think is what plausible information I need to give them so that I can give them this. And then I'll figure out later how they work. OK, so time came. Maybe it was last night sometime. I had to go fill that in. OK, so how are we going to fill this in? So let's go look where we filled these in. Count adjacent values specified. Let's go look at that. Count adjacent values specified. How does that work? Well, folks, this uses something called a scanner. Um, uh, I didn't know Java supported scanners built in. Um, I knew about scanners in general because I've used them, but they used to be much more involved infrastructure. I searched online um, uh, and oh, I found, OK, Java is a scanner now. That's great. And what I can do is I can basically skip any white space and ask it for all things on this line, on this string. I passed it the, the, the string that was the, representing this line. I can ask it for all pieces of the line that are not white space. In other words, that aren't spaces, aren't tabs, that aren't um, uh, whatever other space related things there are. Um, and it will give each to me in turn. Um, and it gives me, in particular, these are presumably digits. So as long, I'm basically counting the things that are not white space on this line. So as long as there's another one, I count it, and I increment this count. This count is going up from 0. Starts, there's nothing on that line that I know about. Then I go through and I say, OK, give me all the things that are not white space, one by one by one. Okay. Anything that's not white space will give me one by one by one. So it's going to give me the first zero. Okay, 
you got me a zero I'm not even verifying it here I'm just getting it and then I'm counting it plus plus maybe I should be count maybe I should check that it's not a some other sort of thing but I I figured okay uh, uh, I'll just assume it's zeros and ones here um, so I'm counting it okay I have one thing and then I go back give me the next thing okay I got a I got a zero now okay increment this count again give me the next thing zero fine give me the next thing give me a one okay count values plus plus okay now count values plus plus is up to four um it went from zero to one in the first thing second three four okay now i return that value i'm done there's no more things here i've run out of things to give it there's no this while ends because there's no has next anymore this returns true or false so it just keeps it going till there's anything more to give and then i return four okay so that counts to me the number of people the number of um items here which is the number of people in the population and that's what allowed me to do this uh to do this thing count nodes equals count adjacent value specified so that four was just the count of each of these things here so i could fool it i could put in uh watch this um well it's probably not going to like it i could probably put in you know as far as that's concerned i could probably do this nate um <laughs> Sorry, don't do this at home, folks. Um, and uh, and then I'm going to run this thing, and I bet it will still create a a four-person population because it's not checking. Uh, oh, nope. Oh, because I I didn't fix where the file was. I'm sorry, I, I still was trying to reproduce that error before. Get rid of these characters. There we go. Okay, run it. Okay, um, boom. Uh, here's a four-person file. N-A-T-E, right? Um, uh, it's, it's using that information and it's using that and it counts it as, a, as being a person, okay? Um, okay, so uh, in short, you, can, you know sort of how the algorithm works so you could fool it. Okay, so that was count adjacent value specified. What else did we use here? What else was I counting on my big older brother to write? Um, Count adjacent value specified was one thing. Create population size. How does that work? Anyone remember? We did this before. How does, how does create, if I wanted to, if I pass it a count of nodes, this is the count of people I want in the population. How does that, just think, how would you create a population of that size? Okay. That's right. So it's a, uh, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so it, it's an, it, it, what you need has an L, two O's, and a P. A loop, right. So, so let's go take a look at it, and then I'll tell you my funny story. Um, OK, here's create population size. And look, there's a loop, right? Um, and it does exactly what you're mentioning. It, starts, it goes from 0 to the population size, and each time it does add population. What is this thing? What does that do? Does anyone remember? We saw that before in an earlier lecture. Yeah, where, where is population? What, why is this population not pop? It's a, it's a method call. You're, you bet it is. But what, why does this say population? Why doesn't it say capital P population? Where did that come from? It actually comes from this. So this is... This is, a, if you go back and you look at my lecture on dynamic networks and populations, this is how you add people into the population. You do add under bar the population name. So if there are three populations, there'd be add under bar population one, population two, population three. Okay, so create population of size. All it does is it's a simple two person thing. It, it loops through and each time it adds one person into the population. It has a clear, well-defined purpose you can specify what it does without worrying about the details and then later come back and deal with the details if you have to, to write it, okay? So this loops through and creates the population of that fixed size. Now the funny story is, um, so uh, I took my first computing course when I think I was in about fifth grade um, and <laughs> it was an adult education course and I came in and the, the room was full of uh, teletype machines and adult students who are to their 50s and so on. And I was this little kid, and I, 
I'd been programming calculators in assembly language, but I didn't know how to program these machines. I didn't know how to program in BASIC or anything like that. So the, prof the, the professor, the, 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 the teacher was there. And he would teach us things, but really what I wanted to do was get on the machines and kind of frob them and, and, and uh, program them. And um, then there was going to be a test at the end, a test of our learning. And I was kind of scared because I didn't, I, I really hadn't paid much attention to the lectures. And so uh, the professor um, was reviewing the material for the test. And he was walking up and down the roads of the class. And I was sitting here, you know, as this fifth grader or something. And he said something like, suppose you want to count from 0 to 100. What would we use? And he looked at me. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, I'll give you a hint. It has an L, two O's, and a P. And I said, pool? <laughs> I think he gave up on me. Um, <laughs> prematurely, I think, uh, in, in my view. Um, anyway, uh, an L two O's and a P. That's what this is. Uh, that's all it is, and it's not a pool. Um, okay, so uh, it's pretty good though at doing anagrams. Um, okay, uh, okay. So that's create population size. The other thing we have, the other piece of this. I mean, folks, we're almost done with how this reads the file. And the only other piece is how it does what? How it connects people. And that's the rub. OK, so this is a little bit more complex, um, I've got to say. But you can see it's not that bad, actually. Um, all it does is it reads in, OK, so first of all, we, we set it up. OK, this thing, we have to set it up. We have to give it the information it needs. And what information does it need? to figure out who to connect to who. I told you earlier, it needs what? Who you are and who you're connected to. And who you're connected to is defined by this. Who you are is defined by your number of your person. Now, as it turns out, there's a little bit of a, of a sleight of hand here. But, um, uh, but that's, that's basically, um, basically it, OK? And um, what happens here is that it it takes this line and it creates this scanner thing and it goes through and it basically goes through and it looks for ones, okay? And for each one, it connects two people, okay? Um, so it is given a who you are and that's a I from note. So that's an index of who you are, zero, one, two, three in the popu population and a str line, uh, which is the the, the current line, um, it's the, the, the sort of uh, this line. It's a string. So what if you add maybe 100 to 100 itself? Yeah. 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 Could we just go kind of start with that as kind of a basic idea and then manipulate based on character terms and things like that to index and do the same? Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 We could. Um, I did this as kind of... Um, a small matrix um, like this. Sometimes they're represented this way, but you could do it in Excel where it's all separated by commas or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, y you know, you might have to do a few more frobbing things or sort of looking for the split it up by the commas or whatever, but actually it'll be, it, it, you might have to add a couple lines, that's all. Okay, so what's going on here? Basically what it's going to do is it's ignoring the white space and it's it's uh, going through and it's looking for ones. And you'll notice here that each, it's going through each character here and it's counting one by one. So the first one is, is zero, person zero in the population. And then it goes one and then it goes two and it's counting over each time until it gets to a one. So this is person zero, person one, person two. Ah, it finds a one. So now it's going to connect from the person that this is being called on that was given by a parameter, the, the row number here at 0, 1. And it's connecting it to the index of this candidate 2 node. I call it candidate because there might or might not be a 1 there. It could be a 0 before this. And here, there actually is a 1, so it's more than a candidate. We know we have to connect to it. So all it's going through, folks, is Okay, if you're, if you're person number 0, 1, 2, it's going through here and says, oh, person 0 I'm not connected to. Person 1 I'm connected to. 
So I've got to connect person two to person one. And the reason it got that person one is because it was just looping through here. It started with person zero at, at this one, and then it went to uh, for, for this one, and by that one it's person one. Can't index candidate two node is one. So it's connecting from person two to person one. And it's getting them, what's this population get thing? What is that thing doing? And why is there, two, why is there another one over here? What, why, why do we need to do that? First of all, what is this thing? It's, hint, it's not a pool. Um, what, what is dot get? What, what, is, what are we doing there? Okay. Okay, good. So we're, formally we're calling a method, right? What are we calling the method on? On population. What is population? It's this guy up here, right? So we're getting the person number I from node from the population. We're getting the person associated with the row from the population, okay? And we're connecting it to the person associated with the column. That's that candidate two node. Maybe I should have called it index column person or something like that. Um, it, probably I could have used a better name, but it's it's uh, I say candidate because I'm not sure if it's a zero or one when I when I have been going through and incrementing it. So in short, ooh, ooh, I deleted, I deleted the, um, hey, oh man, I gotta get, gotta go back and recover this. I from now. Um, so in short, I'm getting the person, this is getting the person from the population. Why do I need the person from the population? I mean, why did I have this? Why do I need to do this? It's all, again, all about sort of thinking. When I was writing this, I was thinking, okay, what do I need? When I was writing this guy here, remember, I wasn't thinking about what was in this thing. I was just thinking, someone's going to do this for me. So when I was writing this outer one, I wasn't thinking about how I was going to do this in detail. I wasn't thinking about how I was going to do it. All I was thinking was what it's going to do and what information does it need to do its job, plausibly. Now that I've got, that I had to do this one, now I was focused on this. Okay, I was like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? What do I need to do? Okay, I have the row number and I'm, I'm somehow have, have to go through and find out which of the items in this row are ones or zeros. That's what I've got to do. And for the ones, I have to add a connection in. So I need some way of kind of finding the ones and zeros on the rows. And that's what the scanner gives me. Um, if you look it up, you know, that's what I found. Okay, yeah, you can kind of go through pieces of a line, have a break them up for you and find those ones. Okay, um, that's great. But, um, and I experimented a bit with scanner, saw how it worked, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so I found the ones, that's great. But now, now that I found two, now that I found, I know my number, say zero, one, two, the, of the person, this connection, person one for the connection. And suppose I know the person number for, for the to whom I'm connecting. So I'm person number zero, one, two, and I'm connecting to person one. How do I connect two people on any logic? How do I connect two people? So if I, if I know I'm person two, and I need to be connected to person one in the population. How do I do that? How do I do that in any logic? Connect, connect to, right. And that's a method on, would it be a method on, on, on deer? Would it be a method on experiments? Would it be a uh, method on pools? It would be a method of what? Who would you look to to figure out who's connected to who. It's the, per, it's the person. It's a, it's, a, it's a method on person. So to connect two people, person, if I know person two, ladies and gentlemen, has to be connected with person one. To do that, I need to get references to them as persons. So all I know here is a, is a number for them. I just know that they're an integer. And to connect them, they need to be more than a number. They need to be a, a reference to a person. So that's what this population.get is. It's taking them their numbers and getting them as people. Why couldn't we get them as people in the first place? Well, 
Well, you know, all we're doing is we're counting up like what row we're on. So we know, okay, we're row zero, we're row one, we're row two. So we know we're dealing with person two. So now we gotta go get person two so we could say, hey, buddy, you get connected with this other person, person one. Why are we dealing with numbers here within a row? Well, we're just going through, I'm at position zero. I'm at position one. I'm at position two. I'm at position three for the person to whom I'm connecting. So this one appears at connection one, at, at, at place one. That's uh, index of candidate two node is one there. And so that's person one. Okay, it, it has a one in there, so I know they have to be connected. So I have to connect person zero, one, two for the row with zero, one for, for the column. Okay, and and to do that, I have to get them as persons. I have to get them from the population, a reference to them as persons. And then I got to say, buddy, you connect to this one. Boom, done. Does that make sense? Okay, so here I'm getting the person associated with the from node. As a person, I'm saying, hey, buddy, you connect to this other person. Okay? You know, it, it probably for didactic reasons, it would have been clearer to do this. Watch this. Okay, would this be clearer? You tell me. Okay, so if I had done, if I had done person, person one, that's by the way, I'm saying create a variable that's a reference to a person, right? And if I had set that like that, um, or you know, person from, I'm imagining the connection going from one person to another. It's actually bidirectional. And then if I had a person two, boom, uh, like this, and, and I had this, and this is person two now, and this is person from, and this is, oh, oh, um, like that. Would that be a little bit clearer? So, so you know, um, this is getting the person from whom, from whom it's coming, and this is the person to whom it's going. These are people in the population, and then I connect them, eh? Um, I'm connecting these two people now such that uh, they're connected, you know, in, the, in, the, in any logic. That is basically how it works. And before that, this I from node, I meaning index, you often see it as an abbreviation, I meaning index, index, uh, here I call it index, it probably, to be consistent, I should have called this index from node, index from node. Um, and over here, to be consistent, I have to call this index from node. Um, let's make sure this compiles. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay, so uh, index from node. This is just a number before this, and then I turn it into a person. I ask population, get me the person with this number. And it says, yes, sir. And it gives me uh, the reference to person from. I say, get me the number of this person. And it gives me this reference called person two, and then I connect the two of them. Now, the problem is that um, there's only bidirectional connections built in right now. So, so here I'm connecting them bidirectionally. I'm assuming it's a symmetric matrix. Um, and uh, if we wanted unidirectional connections, we could do it, but it would be more, more mechanism. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, any logic doesn't support those built in. So ladies and gentlemen, that was sort of how I do, um, that was sort of how I, that was how I do this reading of the connection file. Let's go down and look at the Pyek file. Um, Pyek actually is more work, and we'll see where this issue comes in of arcs. Okay, establish network transitions. Okay, how am I going to do Pyek? Let's go look at Pyek. What ran through my head when I did this at 10 o'clock last night or something? Um, uh, okay, so for Pyek, um, okay, I know I have these sections of the file. Oh, you all. Um, so I have sections of the file, and there's vertices. If I got to create the population size, vertices give me the number of people in the population. That's after this verdict. So somehow um, uh, that, that's going to need to be imposed on the population. And when I connect edges, before I do that, I have to have the population established just as before. This gives me the total population size. That's great. Gives me this other information, but for now I just ignore it, um, the details of their names. I could actually set their names in any logic. I could set their names from this thing very readily. I just right now, I, for, 
because I wasn't sure if there'd be a name property, but uh, it would be easily added. Okay, um, now there's arcs, which are unidirectional, and edges, which are bidirectional. Um, now, depending on how we handle these, we might treat these as bidirectional. I decided to just concentrate on the, the edges side of it. Maybe we, we should add these in just as bidirectional, kind of like we did with the connectivity matrix. Um, in any case, okay, so what do I need to do? Well, first I need to get a way of reading the file. That's what this buffered reader is. I can read it line by line by line. And then this is where I defer to my older brother. I say, okay, um, uh, my brother, older brother will take care of, on the one hand, parsing the vertices. That's the first job. I say parse and process because it's actually going to be creating the population. It's going to be figuring out what's in the file and imposing it. And then it's going to handle the arcs and edges. Okay? Those are the two kind of components, right? And if anything goes wrong, just give a message to the user. Okay? Okay. Now, let's go look at the, the vertices. Okay. Oh boy. Oh boy. Look at that. Um, I got to go down and handle the vertices. Okay, what do I need to do? Well, first of all, I have to go through each line of the PIAC file. Maybe it has all these lines up front, which are just empty. Maybe the person wasn't very careful and they have tabs in them, who knows? So what I'm gonna go down is through it and I'm, tr I'm gonna look for, a, look for a match to something which has vertices. It can either begin with capital V or lowercase v because I didn't know if it was fixed from the file format. I couldn't find a good spec. And then it has, this is what's called a regular expression. And I could give a lecture on this, and if time permits, I may do this, because it's one of the most useful things you can know in terms of finding information. Uh, I have a, a former student who uses these uh, um, as a major component of her work in Alberta Health Services, and she says it's a godsend to processing data there. They're really, really n not well known outside of computer science, but they should be. So this is basically saying, hey, look for something that's like vertices could either begin with a capital or lowercase v. It could have white space before it. It needs a, it needs a star before it. Um, and then it can have white space after the star and then vertices and then some white space. And then it needs to have some digits and then possibly some white space and then the end of the line. That's what that says. It says look for that. Find me a match for that. If you can't match that, I'm gonna ignore you. So if it does this, if, if I match that, then we're golden as far as processing vertices. Otherwise, we, we just are gonna go on to the next line. If we never see a line like that, if, if, if we saw you know, this, it wouldn't even recognize it because it doesn't match, it doesn't match this. You know, uh, it doesn't allow white space in the middle, but it would allow vertices. It would also allow this, it would allow, um, you know, this or whatever. That, that's what's called regular expression. They're super useful, super useful. Anyway, it matches that. Um, and then, okay, now that it matched that, okay, then, now this is a headache. Um, how am I gonna get that number after it? Okay, I gotta get the number. And there's a heavier weight way, which I could actually use Java regular expression. So I just wanted a way to get this number. How am I gonna get that number out of there? And I do what's called split in Java. And basically I, I get it as a string and then I turn it into an integer. See that? I turn it into an integer. And then, now that I have that integer, what can I do with it? Now that I have that integer, what do I do? Why do I want that integer? Why do I want the number of vertices? I want to create the population. Okay, now, now this is great. Now I create the population and now I skip the rest of the vertex declarations. I just get, get rid of them. I don't want to see them. Don't let me see them. So, so I'm going to skip them. And I didn't write that originally as far as I remember. I just said, okay, I'm going to skip it and then I'll come back and figure out how to write it later. Um, and okay, so we'll see later how you come back to it. But that was vertices. Well, okay, maybe we'll finish up vertices now, skip it. Okay, all we do is we go from this to the number of vertices and we try to match, we, this is again a regular expression, we're trying to match anything that's not an empty line. We don't count empty lines. Anything that's not, we go through that many non-empty lines after this and, and then we're gonna be in a position to look for arcs, okay? Um, okay, so that was processing, processing the vertices. Now the other part, remember, there were two parts here that my older brother could do. One was this one, one was 
parts, arcs, and edges. Okay, here's parts, arcs, and edges. Okay, <laughs> this is the naked truth. This is the naked truth. It's, it, it, it's shameful, but I was writing this, I think, at 11 o'clock at night, and um, I, I didn't know. Okay, arcs, I don't know how to support them directly, so I'll, I'm just going to blow them away. I'm just going to look for edges, and then I'm going to parse the edges. Um, so all I do is I go down, and I look for each line, matches, edges, and I went and I say, okay, go ma match me the edges. Once again, I, I allow for flexibility here. I allow for edges to have no spaces before it. It has to have a star before it, but the star can be preceded by space, or it can be followed by space, or not. And then it has to have edges. Oh, to really be more robust, I should either allow capital or lowercase e. Because um, I don't know, maybe sometimes people spell it with lower e. Um, and then I can have spaces after it and then the end of the line. If I see that, now I'm in good shape. Now I can par parse the edge declarations. Okay, so now I can parse the edge declarations. And then there's a little bit of cleanup stuff, just, you know, cleaning up after lunch. Um, uh, just, you know, if anything goes wrong, go re report it. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so this calls Pyek edge declarations. Okay, now we've got to parse that. Now that's, that's a bit of a bear, I think. Um, well, it doesn't look too bad. Okay, so here I go through each line, and if it matches this format, wow, I'm leaning pretty heavily on these regexps. Um, maybe I should give a lecture about these. Um, okay, uh, so, so uh, here it, parse, it looks for a line which matches this. Can anyone tell me, based on my earlier comments, about what these mean? Does anyone want to hazard a guess about what this, this line describes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're hat great, fantastic, impressive. Um, so there has to be space. So there's two numbers. These slash D, backslash D things are digits. And the plus means there's one or more of them. Okay, so there's got to be some of those. And then this backslash S plus, there's got to be space between them. Why space between them? Well, folks, I mean, I'm looking for two different numbers on these lines. That's how, how uh, Payette gives this, okay? Um, and then, um, ah, okay, I think this is why it's not parsing your file, actually. It's right there. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get to it in just a second. So you can have space, bef you, you can have optionally space, that star means zero or one of these spaces before the first of these digits. Um, and you have to have spaces between them. And then I say you can have space after, but this is the thing, this is the killer. And this is why it's ignoring these things, I think. I force it to be after that last digit, it's the end of line. So if you got rid of that dollar sign there, get rid of the dollar sign at the end, Basically, I'm forcing it to just be in a line by itself, like nothing else following it. And often in Payek, I think you have other things. You have like the weight. Yeah, so if you had like 0 0.5 here or 0 0.1 or whatever. And similarly for arcs, or excuse me, similarly for vertices, let's go back and look at vertices. Um, we should debug this regex there so it's more general. Um, uh, I think with vertices, we have to, we're um, parse, oh no, we're just ignoring the vertex lines. So that actually may be the key thing. And I'm basically ignoring arcs. So um, that's, uh, this actually may fix it. So now if I have this thing here, I could have, you know, foo or, or whatever, bar. Um, I don't know if this is legal pi up, but um, um, uh, baz. Um, uh, now let's let's try running this. Um, so uh, first of all, um, so we've we've actually just seen how Pyek works. Um, I'm going to re-enable this Pyek one from the from the beginning here, and uh, this is now in uh, right. Um, it is now in file-driven network structure uh, examples and. It is no longer in that folder. Okay, so let's 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 try running this thing. Um, okay. Um, okay. So uh, that did not. Uh, it, it certainly created the right number of agents, but uh, it exhibited 
uh, problems in connecting them. So um, you may have encountered another problem. Um, so we'd have to, to look at that. But I suspect, um, I suspect that may have a lot to do with, with your, um, your issue. Uh, okay, so wait a minute. Um, ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, it actually wasn't, that wasn't the critical. Uh, eh, okay, I'm gonna, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look at your file. In any case, um, then there's uh, one other thing it does. So this is process edge declaration. So if it finds one of these things, then it treats it as an edge declaration. And then basically the edge declaration needs to extract the two numbers from it. And this is using the same split thing we saw before. So it extracts the, the strings, and then it tries to turn them into numbers, and then it connects the two people just like we saw before. Okay. Now, I had to do something here um, by subtracting one off. And that is because, why do you think I have to subtract this one thing? I'm parsing these pi x edge numbers. Let's suppose pi x said connect one to three. You'll notice I'm taking the pi x edge number and I'm subtracting one off of it in both cases. Why would that be? Why can't I just say connect one to three, person one to person three? Yeah, it's a number from zero. So I needed to, to, to up make it zero offset instead of one offset. That, that is why. Um, now, just for curiosity, folks, I left scattered in the code just partly because I thought it could help you understand how it works if you want to play around with it. Uh, I had various comments in here that I used for debugging, actually. And I'm going to uncomment them. You'll notice there's this like number 29 thing. So that actually says like, okay, I'm parsing this. This is what I got. Um, it gives you a sense of kind of what it got at what space part of the code. And if I <coughs> run this here, I just ran it. It's actually not even getting to that place here um, right now after that change of deleting the, the uh, dollar sign. So I was hoping that would actually fix it, but it, it, it seems to have uh, caused a uh, difficulty. So um, I'm gonna put that dollar sign back in there and uh, and then I'm going to uh, leave that for um, for later debugging. Let's just um, see. Okay, no, no. Um, it's uh, still exhibiting um, exhibiting those issues. So you had done some things to the actual text. Yes, you're right, I did. Um, I mean like these things. Yeah, yeah like uh, but I would think it should ignore them, but let's let's try this. Um, let's let's try getting getting it back and thank you. Um, oops. I would I was thinking it should have ignored it. Oh that's right. Yeah with the dollar sign. Yes, exactly. Good. Good. So basically with with the dollar sign there, it processes it correctly. Without the dollar sign, it should have it should have handled it, I would have thought, but evidently it wasn't handling it properly. So here it parsed it correctly. You, you notice this is what it parsed from the file, one, three, three, four, two, three. It's just printing out um, when it's processing an edge declaration what it thinks the, is in the edge, and I can match that against what's actually in the file. So you notice it's only doing that for the files, for the lines which have it, and that's because it's going through this processing, looking for lines which match this um, this sort of form. Um, and uh, yeah. I think it would be fine. So in other words, like let, let's suppose even that we had something like this, right? Um, I think it will it'll try to connect, and I don't think it actually causes an error in any logic. I think it just as well, okay, fine, they're already connected. So um, yeah, just, they're fine. So you know, we could actually do handle that for edges in that same way, and just, okay, if there's an arc already, and now we had an edge over it, well, fine, not a big deal, yeah. Um, similarly, if, if, if there's, uh, you know, in any case, if there's sort of a, a, a mapping between edges and arcs that uh, would normally, you would think, cause an inconsistency, you would just ignore it. So, um, anyway, so that's that's how this one works. Now, um, 
I want to show you the phase two where I, I made this a bit cleaner um, by, uh, by addressing one issue. But to, to motivate that, I want you to realize that right now I have a cluttered namespace. What I mean by that is I have all these methods here, all these functions. And really, the user doesn't care about most of them, really. What the user maybe cares about is they can establish a network transitions from a matrix file and they can establish it uh, for a connectivity matrix file and from a PIAC file. These guys here are nobody's business. I mean, there are internal details, uh, sorry, these ones here at least, and maybe even this one, are internal details about, um, uh, about how they work. These things are internal details. Really, we shouldn't bother the, the modeling user with worrying about all the gory details of how these are accomplishing their tasks. They should be focused on things they can use these things are secondary for their use. They're really just supporting infrastructure. Um, so what I did in the second file, if you open the intermediate one, um, and you compare that, it's essentially the same code, but um, it is, um, oops, oops. Um, it's essentially the same code, uh, but you'll notice the main class is cleaned up. Those things are simply not present, okay? Um, and, uh, and in particular, what I did, can anyone see a second difference? Okay, so if you open the main class, um, there's uh, sort of a, a wide open space there, but where did those things go to? Can anyone see another difference here? Yeah, there are these two classes. So basically, I, folks, this is the first time you've seen it, I think. I went and introduced two classes. What I did in particular is I went and I went add new Java class, okay? Um, and this is, this is the same code, essentially, or very similar code to what was before, but I put it off in classes. And now each class, like this is one um, connectivity matrix network file processor, and this is PIEC network file processor, okay? And each of them takes care of their own business, and there's only one public thing that does work in each, a thing called process. And you give it two things. You give it a, a pointer to a file, a, a file path and file name, and you give it a reference to the main class. And, and it basically does its work. And it does its work largely in the same way we just talked about. It's just, it, it hides these, the gory details of where it's done. And so all you need to do now in main is you need to call in main, um, main here, if you go up to main, um, let's go up main. Um, you, you see, for example, PIEC network pro file processor dot process and it goes um, and points it to, uh, to the appropriate thing, okay? And similarly, uh, connectivity matrix processor dot process. So basically, it's saying, hey, code off in the class, go process this file, and we have to pass it main so it can do the work, like adding people into the population and that sort of stuff. But basically, we're delegating things off to these places. And this means less cluttering up of our function space. We could have many, many of these. We could have a PIEC one, a connectivity matrix, a UCI net, a Gephi, uh, um, you know, a, um, um, uh, G, a GRF or whatever that, uh, there's another file type, um, guess file. And, uh, and, you know, we could have different processors and simply call off to the one we want. We don't have to clutter up our space with all the details of not only that they're there, but also that they have lots and lots of pieces to do their work. Basically, we allowed encapsulation. We allowed them to hide the details of, oh, um, just going back to the issue we encountered before, um, I think that, um, um, well, yeah, I, I have some speculation on how to, how to fix that issue, but I think I won't bother with that. So here, we have two classes. The classes are, um, have the same code which we had defined in functions previously. It's just, in most cases, they're private, okay? So you'll notice 
the, the two top ones, this is the, what's called a constructor. This is sort of anything you do to build it up. And this is a public thing so that other people can call process. But the rest of it is what we call private. And what that means is no one else can use it. Only, only this things within the class know how to count adjacency values, for example, or know how to add connections from a connection matrix row. No one else has to know how to do it or, in fact, can access it. And that gives us freedom to change it. When we build this class, we evolve this class, we know no one's counting on the details of like how it counts the number of people who are in another in a row. Does it actually count zeros and ones or does it just count ones or does it does it look for any non blank? If if we if we let everyone see that code, they could be counting on it. They could use that code, they could be counting on it. Here only we can use it and only we can access it. So we call it private. No one else should be counting on how it works. And, um, and then uh, this is the code to, to implement it. Um, so this is very similar code to what we had before. It's just it's been sequestered in these classes. Okay. Now, um, uh, while I won't go into it in detail, suffice it to say that um, uh, there's some missed opportunities uh, even here. So one thing is that, uh, that I haven't captured is that both the connectivity file matrix network processor and the PIEC one share some mechanisms. They have certain common patterns in them. And there's no real sharing of those common code right now. There's no, they're, they're kind of re reinventing the wheel for certain things. That, in other words, there's, certain a lot of, there's a certain amount of shared mechanism that could be explicitly shared but right now is implemented just in two different places. And that will turn us to what's called subclassing. A second thing is that um, we don't um, provide a, uh, a sort of a general way of having an interface which could use either of these, and we don't care which it is. Um, and the user could choose, say, at runtime by, choosing, by clicking on a different button which one to use, and it could use either one. <laughs> to do that, we need something called um, subtyping. So we're going to see that in a, in a coming lecture. But suffice it to say that these, these two are both, they have a lot of commonality. They both provide a process method that takes the same sort of thing. It takes a main, a reference to main, and a reference to a string that gives the file. And, and then they do some work. And how they do the work is very similar. So we should be able to take advantage of this. And the more advanced system allows you to actually encode um, within, within the file itself, not only the times at which you want things to happen, but what, how each of these is encoded. So in principle, you could have one of these that encodes it in a PIAC type way, one of these that encodes it and you know, give this there, another which encodes it in using a connectivity matrix. And you basically just feed it. It looks at this first line. It figures out what sort of file it is, gets the appropriate parser, and parses it all. And uh, another thing, a final thing that we haven't supported here is time varying networks. Everything we're doing right now is imposing a network at the beginning of the run. And hence, we had main here just calling off to um, main just calls off process this. And when it processes it, it immediately adds it to the population and, and adds, the, um, adds the edges. Uh, later, we're going to be see how to use another mechanism to add things in at different times. But let me riddle you this now um, in the closing minutes of class here. So suppose you wanted networks to take effect at different times. So suppose we go and we read in this file at the very beginning time, but we want this network, for example, to come into effect at time 12. We want this network to come into effect at time 6. How would we do that using the mechanisms we've talked about in any logic? This is a very good way. Good. That's right. OK, so imagine that we're going and we're reading this in. What sort of thing might be triggered at time six or triggered at time nine or tr 
trigger that? How do we do triggering of something to happen in any logic? Dynamic events is how it happens. And the reason it's dynamic, um, I, was, I would have been happy with just answer events because events trigger things at times. The reason it's dynamic events is, remember the motivation for dynamic events? We talked about this before. A, a, a static event, you simply schedule. It, it goes off on a certain schedule. A dynamic event fires how many times? It fires one or zero times. Tip, typically one time will fire. And you set it up earlier and with all the information it's going to need to do its job come that time. Come that time, it's like a, it's like a ticking time bomb. Maybe that's not a great analogy. Um, <laughs> it's not a very favorable analogy anyway. It's like a, um, it's like a birthday present, um, <laughs> just waiting. Uh, so, so you get sent a birthday present, and it says, do not open to your birthday. This is much better. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, up late coding, you know, you, uh, it, it doesn't come first to mind. Um, so a birthday present. It says, do not open to your birthday. And, and uh, it, it has everything that you're going to need when you open it to make you happy. Well, to make <laughs> whatever, to surprise you. Um, but uh, it's packaged up there. And come your birthday, you're going to open it, and you're going to you know, use it. Um, the new version of any logic um, you know, in the package. Um, so you're going to be able to use it. So a dynamic event. What you can do is at time zero, when it reads in these, reads in these things, um, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to read in the network. It's going to get the network information, and then it's going to save it away in a dynamic event. So I don't want to scare you folks too much, but load in the advanced one. Um, load in the advanced and double click on main. And you'll see there's some extra classes. And I'm actually not too happy with it. I, I want to clean it up some more. I think it could be simple, but at least a little bit. But you'll notice there's a dynamic event called dynamic event impose network, OK? What, OK, let me, without, without um, uh, opening the present right now, uh, what information would a dynamic event need to do its job? If you wanted to wake up at time three or time nine to do his job to impose a network, what information would you need to set it up with so it has all the information it needs to do a job come time nine or come time 12? You need to give it what? OK. Yeah, OK. So what you would need to do, though, is actually give it either a way to read the appropriate place in the file or give it the network already specified. Like, you do this network at that time. So that's what happens right now. If you go click on that dynamic event, you, it has a parameter called network. Okay, That parameter is all figured out at time zero. That parameter is all read in. In other words, net, the network that's passed to it is all figured out. It reads in this entire file at time zero. It parses it. It figures, OK, at time 12, the network is going to go look like this. It creates a dynamic event that says, OK, buddy, you wake up, it's like Rip Van Winkle. You wake up at time 12, and here's your network that you're going to be operating with. Um, and, uh, and then we have some code, which at that time, look at this. Um, at that time, dynamic network's job in life, it is an older brother, and its job is really easy given that older brother. It first deletes all network connections, and it creates new co network connections based on the network. And, and uh, the creation of the new network connections based on the network. Well, delete all network connections. All that does is, how do you think that works? I'll give you a hint. It begins with an L to O's and a P. <laughs> yeah, so it goes through. It loops through the population, right? Um, and it, it says P dot disconnect from all. Where did we see this? What does this mean? We just saw that in the lecture earlier on Java, right? What is this doing? It's doing what? Yeah, it's going through each person this collection. This is just one collection. It's going through and it's drawing for each person in it. It draws a reference to that person called P. P is a variable that holds this reference to a particular person. And then it says, hey, P, disconnect from everyone. 
And so P says, yes, sir, and, uh, and, and does that, OK? So that's job one, delete all network connections. The older brother didn't have to work too hard for that one. Create network connections, well, this is a little bit more involved, but not too bad. All it asks for is, hey, network, get me the set of all node pairs. It iterates through there, so it gets each pair. And what do you think this pair connects? It's a pair of two integers. What do you think those two integers are? Any clue? If, if I wanted to represent the connections in the network um, as, as pairs, as edge pairs, what do you think the integers would be? So if I wanted to have a network, I, I would tell you this gives all the information in the network, the set of all these pairs. So what must they be? Very likely. They are pairs of their edge, each one is an edge, and an edge connects to people, right, two vertices, and these integers are just the numbers of the vertices. Um, in, in fact, in, in any logic, I believe. So, so all we do then is we get each of these pairs, and then we get, we, we get the person associated with the first of those pairs. This is the same pattern we saw before. We have a number. Um, we have this number. We get the person associated with that number, and we connect them to the person with the other number. That's it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, if you could, that would be fantastic. Thanks a ton. So we connect them to the second person. So this is how it creates the network connections. And so this is based on the network that we created. We read this network back at time zero, the very first time. We just stored it away in the structure called network associated with this dynamic event. We just gave it a network. It remembers its network. And when time comes, it wakes up when it's his birthday or when Rip Van Winkle springs awake. Um, he knows his network, and uh, he deletes all his network connections, and he, he gets all the edges from the network and, and uh, basically uh, attaches all people to, who need to be attached to each other. And, and that completes Rick Vim Winkle's job in life. So it's doing the just using Yeah, you mean for the create network? Yeah. Yeah, create network is just uh, iterating through this. So the network gives up a... Um, a set of these things. It, as far as it's concerned, this get symmetric no pairs just returns a collection and a connection of pairs, and it goes through each of those uh, pairs and connects them up. Now, how this is implemented will be different depending on how the network is stored. So some networks are stored, it turns out, using a uh, symmetric array. Some are stored using node pairs. Uh, like, if I read in from Pyac, I store it as some node pairs. If I, if I read it in from a um, <clears throat> binary array, I store it as a symmetric array. So each of these has a different way of giving up a um, get symmetric node pairs. So this is how it does get symmetric node pairs. If I already have a node pair connection, this is another way of storing a network. Um, a get symmetric node pairs just returns its pairs. That's all. <clears throat> So in short, folks, um, dynamic events provide that key for easily implementing these dynamic networks. We just create a dynamic event for each of these guys. This, so at, when this model starts, there's a dynamic event set to go off at time 3, another one to go off at time 6, another time to go off at time 9, another to go off at time 12, another to go off at time 15. And each of those times, it wakes up and imposes this network. And that network is stored internally in different ways. So we're going to get to this, but this is advanced stuff. I, just, uh, I don't mean to throw you off. It's just uh, it's a bit of a hint. And it turns out there's a lot of features of any logic that makes it nicer to do this than you might think. Okay? And this is what this sort of infrastructure also allows you to specify, like at the beginning of a file, what type of uh, network uh, sort of encoding do you want to use, and it'll pick the right way to parse it. And it also would allow you to, for example, have in an interface parse as PyEC file, parse as whatever, and you know choose what, what sort, and it will use the appropriate type. OK, so that's all for today. Um,
Uh, we're going to meet again on Friday, I believe, and we'll continue our discussion uh, with model sensitivity and maybe model calibration as well. Okay? And uh, Deval, if you could, might be able to send me that, um, uh, that, that uh, audio file, that would be great.